In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today, you are going to need a little bit of backstory on this one because it's a Old Testament story, but it's one that not as many people are familiar with. I want you to remember going into this that Moses never wanted to be the leader of Israel. Because if you'll remember back to the story of the burning bush, God calls Moses and Moses is not real fond of that idea. In fact, there is almost an entire chapter of the Bible that's just Moses arguing with God and giving him all the excuses and reasons why he can't be the one to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. Doesn't want to do it. So he basically gets dragged, dragged into this gig kicking and screaming. Doesn't want to be the leader of the Israelites. It's a burden he never wanted to bear. And then you fast forward to the uh, Mount Sinai, and we see a picture of Moses praying to God that his wrath would be spared for the sin of creating the golden calf. He's praying to God to spare the Israelites because God suggests to him, you know what? I'm tired of it. I just got done bringing these people out of Israel, and already they're engaging in idolatry. They're already worshiping another god. I mean, it was like five minutes ago that they saw Pharaoh's army swallowed up by the Red Sea, and they're already creating other gods and worshiping them and saying that those are the gods that brought me out of Egypt, so I'm just going to wipe them off the face of the earth. And Moses is there pleading, God, don't do that. That's a really bad idea. Now, that's an oversimplification of that story, but that's not really what our story is about, so I can't go into all the details, but just remember, that is a thing that occurred, that Moses had to plead the case of the Israelites to God to prevent him from wiping them out. And then two chapters before this one, in Numbers 14, a very similar episode happens, where the children of Israel are murmuring, they're not following God's laws, they are... Uh, talking bad about God and, and complaining, and God's fed up with them again, and Moses again goes to God and pleads their case to him and asks him not to pour out his wrath on the children of Israel. This is the point in the Bible where it's very clear that the children of Israel are just bound and determined to fuss about everything. And with the people grumbling here, they finally get to the point to where they try to overthrow Moses and Aaron, and this particular rebellion is led by a man named Korah. So even after all of this, they've decided that they know what's best for themselves, and they don't like the fact that Moses and Aaron are leading them through all this, and so they're just going to appoint new leaders. What we're going to do is we're going to get together and we're going to put Korah in Moses and Aaron's position, and we'll have Korah be the high priest, and then he's going to lead us into the promised land. And that really brings us to the verse that we're going to focus on today in Numbers 16, verses 20 through 22. Then the Lord spake to Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I might consume them instantly. But they fell upon their faces and said, O God, O God, of the spirit, God of the spirits of all flesh, when one man sins, will you be angry with the entire congregation? So we see another episode where yet again Israel has done something really dumb and God shows up and is really angry and we have this time both Moses and Aaron pleading the case of the Israelites to God. It's a really fascinating exchange here and I think one of the things that really highlights, uh, that is one of the big highlights of this passage is if this verse doesn't strike fear into your heart, then you didn't read it right. And I say that genuinely, because look at the way that that first verse, uh, sorry, the, the second verse there is talking about, it says, remove yourselves from this congregation so that I might consume them instantly. 
Now, that's more impactful if you know that a couple verses beforehand, one of the ways that God was getting ready to punish Israel is by sending a plague amongst them. And there was retribution for Israel acting foolishly in front of God and not following his will and his statutes and breaking the covenant that they had made with him on Sinai. Well, God's had enough. He has reached his limit. Now, understand he doesn't really have limits in the same way we have limits, but you understand what I'm saying. Like, God has reached a point to where he believes that the children of Israel have reached a point where they are not going to listen to him. And so, to put this into human terms, this is the point where God has grabbed his belt. He's done hearing excuses. He's ready to delve out some punishment. And when he does this, he says, you know what? A plague is too slow. That is not an appropriate punishment for what these people have done. I'm tired of waiting. You guys get out of the way so that I can take them out right now. That's a terrifying verse. Christian, non-Christian, whatever. I mean, God is getting ready to delve out the punishment at this point. He is looking for a behind to whack with his belt. And the children of Israel are about to catch the full brunt of God's wrath. And yet here we have Moses and Aaron showing up and pleading their case and saying, Lord, you're not going to destroy the entire congregation for the actions of these people. And God explains to them, of course he's not going to do that. He says, I'm, I'm only going to get the ones that rebelled. And some people read this as that uh, Moses and Aaron convinced God to do this. I don't really see it that way. I see it more as a, um, they were asking the question like, God, are you going to take out everybody for this? And he's saying, no, I'm not going to do that. Tell everybody to move away, and I'm about to delve out my punishment. But uh, the core message remains that the kid gloves just came off. And God rolled up his sleeves, and, and stuff is about to get set right. And that's something that we probably have all reached in our lives with God, too. I know I have. That you've reached a point in your life to where God says, all right, this one's going to hurt but it's going to be ultimately for your own good. I'm pretty sure I've been in that position before. I know that we don't have a direct dialogue with God the way that Moses and Aaron did, but I've felt that. And, you know, it's not an easy thing to recover from, but you do learn from it. And I think that this is really no different. Because... You look at what has happened here, and, and the analogy of a father is very, very strong in this particular verse. Look at everything that God has done for them. If you look at this point up in Israelite history, he has already saved them from slavery. And by the way, didn't do it through causing a rebellion and some kind of armed resistance. No Israelites died, at least so far as we know. God just handled it. And the same thing happened with Pharaoh's army. God didn't even send them into battle and give them supernatural help. He just destroyed them for them. And then he brings them out into Sinai and gives them the blessing of his covenant and his law. And then he's taken them into the desert and he sweetened the waters so that they could drink. He's been giving them food every single day in the form of manna. He's already protected them from various Canaanites that have attacked and, and so on and so forth. Like God has been there holding their hand every single step of the way, taking care of them, making sure that their needs are met, and creating this nation that is going to be a blessing into all the world, and they won't shut up. All they have done since the beginning of this journey is fuss and complain and whine. And so you can understand why God's finally like, you know what, it's time to take them out. I'm tired of it. I'm waiting for this generation to pass on anyway so that we can enter the promised land and do what I need done. It's time to just get rid of them. And when this rebellion happens, you'll notice that it is specifically rebellion that has caused God to 
be the this was the straw that broke the camel's back when it came to God doling out his wrath. And I think that that is incredibly significant because you'll notice that they've done all these other things. They fuss, they've whined, they've complained, but it's rebellion when that happens. Everybody better get out of the way because God's about to delve out some punishment. And what's significant about that is this wasn't a rebellion against Moses. It was kind of aimed at Moses and Aaron, but ultimately it was a rebellion against God. It was a rebellion against God's way of doing things, about God's decision not to bring people into the land of Canaan at the time that they wanted. They were ready. They thought they should be the ones to enter the promised land. And God's like, no, that's not the plan. And they say, well, you know what? If Moses and Aaron, they're telling us that that's not what God wants us to do, we're just going to do it ourselves. We're going to take care of it anyway. God's like, "Uh, no, you don't either. That's really where we are in this story. And if you read the story of Korah, what really strikes about you is they're upset that Moses and Aaron, the way that they describe it is they have exalted themselves and they're saying it's time for us to really take over the priesthood and we want to be in your position. Moses didn't even want to be in his position. I mean, I'm sure that he's grown more accustomed to it than he did, you know, way back at the burning bush where he was first starting out. But Moses didn't even want to be in this position. This isn't something that he coveted or longed for. He didn't want the burden of leadership. Moses probably would have been fine just being a shepherd out in the land of Midian. He probably would have been cool with living the rest of his life like that, having never even gone back to the children of Israel in Egypt. See, the difference here is they wanted the priesthood because of the prestige, and they wanted to grow their own power. God put Aaron and Moses in that position because they didn't want those things. And that's why I think that this is one that gets God so riled up. Because their response is, we're going to take over God's priesthood, the people, the, the institution that God has put in place to bless his people and to oversee the worship of him. We're going to take over it so that we can get ours. It's like one of the televangelist preachers that gets into preaching to become a millionaire, to sell a whole bunch of books, and to be world famous. Well, you're kind of in it for the wrong reasons, and God does not look favorably upon that. You're wanting to use God's worship as a way to enrich yourself? Really? That's your plan. And so, when you look at it in that light, you understand why God was so furious about all of this. And the irony here is that it is Moses and Aaron that are pleading for mercy for the rest of them. Because this is a proposal that God has already thrown out there, and I think that it was more of a teaching moment than he was actually contemplating it. But it was very possible for God to just bless the world and and bring his son to bring salvation to mankind through Moses and Aaron. He could have just started over. He did it with Noah. Why not? He would have still kept the promise to Abraham, the the lineage from Jesus to Abraham still would have been there if it had come through Moses and Aaron. That's certainly possible. But that's not what was important to Moses and Aaron. You see, they were in the position for the right reasons. They loved God and loved the children of Israel and wanted what was best for all parties involved. And that's the reason that they're saying, God, are you really sure you're going to destroy the entire congregation for the sins of these rebels? And then God, of course, explains to them, no, he's not going to do that. But the point is, when that happens, it is Moses and Aaron that are the ones that are compassionately worried about other people, whereas Korah just wanted to be in their position so he could worry about himself, and so he could do things the way he wanted to do. That's the difference in Moses and Aaron and Korah and the people that followed him. And then, of course, we know that the end of this story What happens is that God has everybody in the congregation step away from Korah in his tents, and then the earth opens up and swallows them. Uh, That is swift justice, if there ever was one. This isn't the fiery serpents. This isn't God sending out a plague to slowly whittle them down. No, he takes them out right then. Takes no time at all. One minute they're there, the next minute they ain't. And it was just as simple as that. Because that is how God treats people that want to abuse the positions of power that he has set up. They want to abuse the worship of him and use it for their own ends. God does not take that lightly. And that's something that we would all do well to remember. 
And I think maybe the reason that he said it this way and, and gave that pause was to teach the lesson that, that I just gave you. And it was to teach that lesson to Moses. I don't think I'd ever had any intention of going after the people that had not rebelled against him, just the, the people in Israel that they may have been fussing and grumbling and moaning, but they weren't actually in open rebellion, and he always intended to only get Korah and his men. But I think the reason that God at least phrases it that way to where Moses and Aaron had to ask that question is to teach Moses and Aaron about mercy as well. You see, God is the ultimate teacher, and he never really stops teaching. Every moment is a teaching opportunity for him. And I thank God that he is that way. Because we need a lot of learning and a lot of maturing to do. You see, God may dislike grumbling. He may dislike it when people complain about him. But when rebellion happens, that has to be dealt with very swiftly. And this story is an example of that. So just like all human beings, I'm sure there are times where we don't feel like we're being treated right and we may complain and fuss. And granted, we should keep that to a minimum, and the children of Israel are a great case study of that. But ultimately, we have to remember that there is a difference in that in open rebellion. And what you never want to do is be in open rebellion to God. That's a fight that you're never going to win. Stay the course, friends. It's not exactly a secret that YouTube really doesn't like conservatives, so I'm asking for your help. I don't want to stick it to them. I just genuinely want to show them that conservative voices do matter and that there is a big, passionate audience out there that wants to hear them. So give us a like and subscribe, remembering to click the notification bell, and show YouTube that you do want more content like this. Sincerely, thank you.